it's like John Paul's Theology of the Body all about. And, well, um, John Paul understood that there was something missing in at least the understanding of marriage that was prevalent in the world. The understanding of masculinity, femininity, and understanding of sexuality. And so he devoted Psalms 133 Wednesday lectures whenever he was in Rome, which put together are referred to as his Theology of the Body, or Theology of Marriage, or Theology of Masculinity and Femininity. And he begins his Theology of the Body by referring to Mark 10.2 and Matthew 19.8, where some Pharisees came to Christ and tried to catch him in a contradiction. Uh, Jesus had spoken of marriage uh, and used that interesting expression from the beginning, from the beginning. Uh, at any rate, Pharisees came to him and said, Why did Moses command one to give a certificate of divorce and put her away? We used to be able to have divorce under Moses. How come we can't have divorce any longer? Uh, and Jesus responded by saying, For your hardness of heart, Moses allowed you to divorce your wives. But from the beginning, it was not so. He keeps repeating this reference to from the beginning. Of course, he's referring to Genesis. In the beginning, the Creator made them male and female. Therefore, a man leaves his mother and father and cleaves to his wife, and they become one flesh. One flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man put asunder. Two in one flesh. Now, after Alan Gore lost his election uh, several years ago to uh, George Bush, he and his wife put together a book uh, called Joined with the Heart. And many chapters illustrating different kinds of marriages uh, for the Gores. As long as these people were joined with the heart, uh, they could call themselves married. Uh, same sex marriage of males or females of different combinations. As long as they're joined at the heart, that's good enough uh, to justify calling them married. Uh, anyone familiar with that book, Joined at the Heart? It seems to be a case of using a metaphor that doesn't have a basis. It also raises the question when Christ talks about two and one flesh, is he just talking in terms of a metaphor without a basis? Or is he literally talking about? Two people coming together and achieving such an extraordinary intimacy that literally they are two in one flesh, joined to the heart. If that's all it takes to be married, of course, joined to the heart. I mean, a mother could marry her daughter, a father could marry his cousin, a sister could marry her brother, as long as they love each other and they have some affection for each other. It seems to be a total disregard of the structure, the design of the male body and the female body. And of course, it represents again. The antithesis of what John Paul was getting at when he was talking about the theology of the body. Joined in a very physical way with a male body and a female body, not this metaphorical, lightweight business of as long as they're joined in the heart. It sounds nice, but it's baseless, it's groundless, it really uh, disregards the body. But I, I think this is, this is a, a fascinating notion, two in one flesh, and whether Christ wants us to understand that in a, a literal kind of way. Uh, now, a couple of things we have to understand in order to appreciate this joined, uh, this two-in-one flesh intimacy between husband and wife. Uh, there's something called the documentary hypothesis that John Paul accepts. For a long time, a lot of people believed that the first five books of the Old Testament, sometimes called the Torah or the Talmud, were all written by the same person, Moses. But scholars have made it rather clear that these uh, five books were written by many different people in different places at uh, different times. In other words, these documents were written by different people at different times in different places. So this is the documentary hypothesis. And there are many kinds of writers. Nobody knows the actual names of these writers, but there are groups of writers. For example, there, is, there are these priestly writers. And the priestly writers tend to get right down to business. Uh, the priestly writers said, and God made them male and female, he made them. And then there are the Yahvist writers who tend to be poetic and they tend to refer and relate their message to the inner spirit of the human being. The priestly writers are concerned about teaching, and they're very objective and very brief. The Yahvist
prophets writers want to touch the soul of the human being, and they speak in, in beautiful poetic language, that's what they are and being. They don't say, oh, God made the male and female, and that was it. There is this, this story of creation in two stages. So the office writers say that God created Adam out of the earth. And Adam was lonely. Adam experienced what John Paul called a cosmic solitude. Everything that God created was good, but then God said it is not good. It's the first time he said not good. It is not good for man to be alone. So he put man into a deep sleep, and out of his side he fashioned the woman. So there's creation of the human beings in two stages, according to the Yavis writers. The Yavis writers, Genesis, want people to experience in an, in an emotional, inner kind of way what it's like to be lonely, what it's like to be needed, what love is like, and so forth. Whereas the priestly writers uh, just want to get down to business, as I mentioned, they just want to teach the, the bare facts. So we have this, this notion of the woman being made out of the side the man. Now, Thomas Aquinas says that if the woman were made from a man's head, then she would be superior. If she were made from his feet, then she would be inferior. But because she was made from his side, uh, she is considered his, his equal. She's equal, but she's different. Or as uh, Pope John XXIII once said, men and women are equal in dignity, but complementary in mission. So the man is for the woman because uh, of the way she emerges from the side. Or to put it much more eloquently, when Pope Benedict XVI was better known as Cardinal Ratzinger, in a book he wrote called Introduction to Christianity, he makes this beautiful comment. One of the soldiers thrust a lance into Christ's side, and immediately blood and water came out. This is John 1934. For John, the picture of the pierced side forms the climax, not only of the crucifixion scene, but of the whole story of Jesus. Now, after the lance thrust that ends his earthly life, his existence is completely open. Now he is entirely poor. Now he is truly no longer a single individual, but Adam from whose side Eve, a new mankind, is born. Christ is the second Adam. And just as out of Adam's side came the woman, and so Adam is for the woman, protecting and loving the woman. Uh, so to uh, Christ's open side, uh, gushing forth the, uh, the blood and the water, symbolizing redemption and baptism, indicates that he is for others. And also, priests are for others. And Christianity means for others. Uh, now Christ is truly no longer a single individual, but the second Adam from whose side Eve, a new mankind, is formed. No longer hardened, isolated individuals, but for other people. So, the lance piercing Christ's side represents the climax of the Gospel of John. And it mirrors the, uh, the second stage of creation, where Eve is uh, taken from Adam's side. That profound description in the Old Testament, according to which the woman is taken from the side of man, an inimitable expression of their perpetual dependence on each other, and their unity in one humanity. That story seems to be echoed here in the recurrence of the word side, the Greek word plura usually translated wrongly by a rib. So it's not really a rib. It's kind of a convenient, poetic uh, invention, I suppose. But it's a plura. It means the sock. And it means equality. But it means that Adam is for Eve, just as Eve is for Adam. The open side of the new Adam, who is, of course, Christ, repeats the creative mystery of the open side open side of man. It is the beginning of a new definitive community of men with one another, a community symbolized here by blood and water, in which John points to the basic Christian sacraments of baptism and the Eucharist, something sacramental about being for another in a certain kind of way. 
of the sacraments pour out of Christ in a sacramental kind of sense between husband and wife, there was this sacramental intimacy. The fully open to Christ. Um, you know, Mary Daly, who was a secular feminist, and taught many years at Boston College, taught theology, and she would never allow men to be in her classroom because she was fighting for sexism. <laughs> She said that the original sin was good because it allowed us to fall into freedom. So we didn't have to be poor other people. <laughs> um, John Paul in his crossing threshold of the book says that the original sin is more than anything else the attempt to abolish your father. Because if we get rid of fatherhood, we get rid of an important kind of relationship. If we get rid of God, if we get rid of the Father, then, then we can be free. And, and we see this in uh, Stephen Coleman's uh, uh, recent controversy book about uh, uh, the idea that the great evil, the great evil in the world is a uh, you know, golden ring. The great evil in the world is authority. If you don't get rid of authority, if you don't, you don't need to read the whole book, but just read the, uh, the dust jacket. And he says, my sympathies are with the serpent. Because the serpent was introducing Adam and Eve to freedom and individuality. So Mary Daly says the fall was good because we fell into individuality. But the fall was bad because it, it created a, a rupture between human beings. And Adam and Eve suddenly looked at each other as objects, objects of lust, and they felt obliged to make aprons of fig leaves to uh, uh, hide their shame uh, so that they could at least uh, perhaps uh, limit the amount of lust they would experience. For the first time, they, they, they no longer were exactly for each other, but there was this uh, almost predatory sense that they could use the other as an object. We have fallen into individuality. I was mentioning to a, a John earlier on the ride back from the airport that uh, my son Peter and his wife are expecting their first child, and it's either, who knows, but it's supposed to be either tomorrow or on Mother's Day, so my wife is praying for Mother's Day would be a nice gift for him to the first child on Mother's Day. But he was married on July the 4th, which is kind of funny because he was getting married on Independence Day. But many Americans need to be reminded of once in a while that they, they were independent from England, but not independent of each other, or independent from God, or independent from Christ. <laughs> Independence is a very limited thing. Okay, uh, be independent from King George, that's fine, but not from each other and not from everything else. Uh, so, this, this is an interesting bone of contention, uh, with a good mind or bone of contention that um, it is the fall uh, from Eden uh, a good thing or not a good thing? Was the, was the serpent uh, wise or was the serpent uh, not wise? Uh, what is the nature of the human being? And all the while John Paul is developing his theology of the body, he's asking over and over again this anthropological question, what is the human being? Is a human being made for love, or is a human being made for isolation? And in those 133 talks, he's trying to link the anthropological with the scripture. And I think he does a wonderful job, because it, it directs reason into the scripture, and scripture is a kind of confirmation of reason. But what I'd like to do at this point answering the question when Christ talked about two in one flesh, was he using a fancy poetic metaphor or was he meaning, but did he mean this in a very literal sense? So is it possible to link, let's say, science with anthropology with scripture? So we turn to the science, the rather modern science, of immunology. Now, immunology is absolutely fascinating and it is a young science and it, it has so much more to explore. But immunologists tell us that our body has 100 billion immunological receptors. 100 billion. It's hard to imagine 100 billion of anything. I mean, it's far more than the population of everybody in the world. To have 100 billion things in you that are all working together in harmony, it's hard to find two people that are great. So, and you can, you can sort of uh, scout around and, and date and, and talk and discuss and see counselors and read books and then finally select one person and then even then it might not succeed. So to have a hundred billion of something all working together on the same page and they all have this un 
uncanny ability to distinguish between the self and the non-self. These are uh, complex molecules that all know the difference between the self and the non-self, which immunologists and microbiologists find amazing because some of the differences are so subtle that even chemists themselves can hardly tell the difference. <laughs> but somehow, nature endows these 100 billion immunological receptors to know the difference between the self that they must protect and foreign substances that are a little bit different that they must expel. So they're defending the health of the, of the human being. And it's absolutely amazing. But then a question arises. From the perspective of immunology, in which the body wants to protect itself against anything foreign, how is it possible that uh, male semen entering the woman's body, apparently as a foreign substance, is not repelled by the immune system? Because it comes from the outside, it's foreign, it's alien, it's something different. And the immune systems would say, well, you're not, you're not me. I can tell the difference between self and non-self. You are non-self, so get out of here. Why doesn't the immune system go to work and attack the sperm and uh, get rid of it so that the woman can protect her individuality? As if, as if that's the ideal for a person to, uh, to utilize your immune system in such a way that you are protected against any kind of intimacy with anybody else. So one, one can almost sense that uh, yeah, individuality, that, that must be natural because we do have this immune system. We're very wary of others. Babies come into the world and they're very wary of other people. Uh, we tend to be fearful of strangers, fearful of others. We have a kind of psychological immune system. We distrust people and so forth. And then, then we begin to trust and then we burn and then we go back to not trusting. Well, um, there's a little opening here, which is very interesting. And if it weren't for this little uh, factor, uh, there would be no life at all <coughs> on this planet. The uh, male semen uh, has a rather rich cargo that carries the spermatozoa. It carries at least 13 prostaglandins. It carries uh, some immunoregulatory macromolecules that have an effect on the woman's body in just one particular place so as to suppress her immune system to allow her body to recognize the, sp the sperm as, as friendly. <laughs> so these immunoregulatory macromolecules act as an immunosuppressant, which suppresses the, the woman's body in just the right place so that she makes an immunological exception and chooses, so to speak, just as she chose her husband. <laughs> she chooses his sperm as part of her flesh. And this is also very uh, important for the, uh, the subsequent child. There's a condition that Dr. Rogers would know about, exposed peristalsis, where the uterus tends to expel a little bit child. Um, with with the, the operation, the, the effectiveness of the immunosuppressant, not only is the sperm accepted, but also the baby, the developing uh, baby is accepted. It's not regarded as an alien and, and rejected. So this is kind of a very, very important exception, and one can almost derive anthropological meanings from this exception. That we're supposed to be healthy, and that's why we have an immune system, but we're not supposed to be closed. Uh, just as Adam's side is open to Eve, and Eve is also for Adam, and just as Christ's side is for others, and Christians should be for others, the I thou kind of for each other, reciprocal relationship. So too, even within the, the study of immunology, uh, there is that, that wonderful exception. We're supposed to be healthy, but at the same time, we have this capacity to achieve literally a two-in-one flesh intimacy. So I think when Christ talked about two-in-one flesh, I think he, his message was to be taken literally. And of course, it's taken several thousand years for immunology to catch up to the implications of two-in-one flesh. Uh, this is hitting seriously. We can actually achieve husband and wife uh, intercourse uh, immunosuppressant <coughs> and one flesh intimacy. So the woman's body does not regard the man's body, at least the spermatozoa, as alien or as foreign, but part of her own flesh. Now, of course, there's a lot of discussion these days about same-sex marriage, and can a same-sex marriage be seen on the same level as a heterosexual marriage? Now, nature, of course, uh, is not responsive to political correctness. 
<laughs> Nature goes right ahead and does whatever it's naturally inclined to do, no matter what the Washington Post says or the New York Times says. Uh, spermatozoa have this natural ability to penetrate cells. Right? Now, to put it delicately, uh, if, let's say, male semen is put in the wrong place, it may start uh, penetrating somatic cells. Now, not the sex cell that will lead to fertilization and new life, but a, a somatic cell, which doesn't lead to new life, in fact, uh, does uh, sometimes form cysts, it forms a, uh, sometimes a, a cancerous uh, 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 tumors, and, and the like. And also, it, it plays havoc with the immune system because if the immunosuppressant is put in the wrong place, then it creates what is called an immunopermissive environment which means welcome strangers, let's have a party. It invites foreign substances in, uh, to take root. And this can, this can bring about a lot of pathological conditions that has been well documented in, in medical literature. So if um, the male spermatozoa does its thing, but in the wrong place, it's penetrating somatic cells and possibly creating cysts and tumors and, and cancerous uh, episodes. And if the immunosuppressant is also placed in the wrong place, it creates an immunopermissive environment, which means it no longer acts as a defense against foreign substances, but it practically invites foreign substances into the situation, which creates other problems. So we have um, you know, age, which is, of course, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Uh, there's quite a difference between new life and a cancerous cell. Uh, so when Christ says it's male and female, and it's two in one flesh, this is a, a very, very significant kind of message, that, which is reaffirmed by science. I think immunology offers an interesting reaffirmation of the literal significance of a two in one flesh unity. And, and that's why marriage is indissoluble, because it's two in one flesh. And that's why man and woman are for each other in this, this very profound sense. Uh, I think Ratzinger's uh, uh, quotation, by using Christ's side as mirroring Adam's side, uh, shows a, a very interesting kind of relationship between the sacrament of marriage and the sacrament of holy orders. So there's kind of a sacramental connection between husband and wife and the priest and his church, and Christ and his <laughs> mystical uh, relationship with, uh, with the church. Now, <clears throat> I guess there are a lot of implications to uh, some of the things I just said. Um, I, I touched briefly on a kind of psychological uh, Indian system. We're, we tend to be suspicious of other people. And uh, how do you dispel this content, S-M-I-L-E? A smile is an immunosuppressant. Right? I mean, we tend to be kind of psychologically guarded. I don't trust him. Who is he? Uh, do you know anything about this guy? <laughs> um, and so we, we go for life in an alienating kind of way. New Perspectives on Contraception. I wanted this image. Uh, it was painted by the Belgian surrealist painter, Rene Magritte, 1928. It's called The Lovers. Well, they are emanating from each other. It seems to be a, an icon of frustration. It seems to be a, a symbol of how contraception keeps people separated from each other. In 1928, just about the whole world was united against contraception. Uh, I told the, the publishers that this is the cover I wanted because it, uh, you know, pictures with a thousand words. <laughs> um, and uh, he spent quite a bit of time trying to find where he'd get a transparency from which this cover could be made. And he finally found one at the University of California at Berkeley. <laughs> <laughs> and they drew up a contract, and it was a, a very reasonable contract. It wasn't going to cost, cost a lot of money. And then something happened. Somebody at the University of California, Berkeley, started reading the book. Um, uh, and of course, you know, uh, contraception is just understood as uh, it is, it's reasonable and uh, there's no argument about it. And they said, uh, they voided the contract, they tore up the contract. They said, we don't think that Rene Marguerite would have approved his picture of this book. <laughs> but, but the thing is, I think that's what he meant. And in 1928, painted this, the whole world was against contraception. It wasn't until 1930, the Anglican <coughs> Conference in England, that there was 
first tiny little crack in the door. You know, if, if a couple's married, if they completed their family, if they have very good reasons not to want more children, and if they prayed and all that goes on and on, then maybe they can practice contraception. And uh, it was interesting at that time that the Washington, the Washington Times uh, wrote an interesting editorial saying, it's foolish to think that you could open the door a little crack and it wouldn't swing off the hinges. And it's also ridiculous to think that you could harmonize uh, scripture with uh, contraceptive technology. I mean, even the secular press was against contraception. Well, the next Lambeth conference, uh, the door was very, very open. And then the question, should, should people who are not married use contraception? Maybe that's good because they wouldn't have a lot of children. Maybe everybody should use contraception. Maybe it should be mandatory. It goes on and on and on. So you open the door a little bit, it's like the camel's nose. The camel gets his nose in the tent and very soon the entire camel is in the tent. So one reason I banished the table was because it was a sort of a, an impediment. <laughs> We're talking about intimacy, so I can't have this obstacle uh, in our path. But uh, we have a special deal on this tonight. The four copies here. Uh, this is an article on the nature of the priesthood, drawing a connection, the sacramental connection between marriage and the priesthood. Uh, 1990, again, when Pope Benedict was better known as Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, the nature of the priesthood. <coughs> And he says, of great importance for our question is the fact that Jesus gave his power to the apostles in such a way that he made their ministry, as it were, a continuation of his own mission. I mean, the apostles' mission was grafted onto, onto Christ as a continuity between the two. two. <clears throat> he who receives you receives me. He himself says to the, the twelve, uh, many of the texts are used, many, many texts that confirm this, the continuity between the mission of Jesus and that of the apostles is once again illustrated with great clarity in the fourth gospel. As the Father has sent me, even so I send you. And he says the weight of this sentence is evident. If we recall what we said above, concerning the structure of the mission of Jesus. As we saw, Jesus himself, sent in the totality of his person, is indeed mission and relation from the Father and to the Father. In this light, the great importance of the following parallelism appears. The Son can do nothing of his own, um, his own accord. And um, John 15, 5, apart from me, you can do nothing. Uh, so much for autonomous individuality. <clears throat> Apart from me, you can do nothing. This is a phrase that intrigued Jacques Maritain, a great Catholic philosopher. Uh, without me, you can do nothing. In his book, uh, God and the Permission of Evil, he says there are two ways we can read the statement. Without me, you can do nothing. It can be read, without me, you can do nothing good. This is the line of being or good where God has the first mission. Without me, you can't do anything good because all the good comes through me. It's like a, a floor lamp that uh, uh, once I was making up funny Christmas gifts for my students that had some kind of philosophical implication. One of the gifts was a, a, a John Paul Sartre floor lamp could automatically unplug itself so it would be free. <laughs> So our floor lamp that automatically unplugs itself so it can be free. But it doesn't do what it's supposed to do, you know, uh, shed light, because it's disconnected from its source. There's no electricity. If we're disconnected from Christ, then we don't have any electricity, and we're missing something. So if electricity could talk, you could say to the floor lamp, without me, you know, you can do nothing. You can't shine. You can't shine without me. You need me. Uh, so no
good, and that privation, which is called evil. In other words, uh, without Christ, we can do nothingness. We can we can insert uh, a wound into into others. It's one thing not to be able to do something that's good, but it's even worse, I think, to do something that's harmful. Without me, you can do nothing. You introduce that nothingness, that source of evil, that privation. Uh, people who are very close to each other, uh, they can be guilty of what we might call intimate harm. You know, a priest who has a lot of influence uh, can do a lot of harm. He can introduce a wound into the church. Not only can he not be able to do something good, but if he pulls completely away from Christ, he can introduce something which is really a wound or, or something which is harmful. Uh, it's just a little aside that Maritain is thinking about that without Christ, uh, you know, without me, you can do nothing. And that has those two levels of meaning, not being able to do something that is positive. And introducing that nothingness, that negative, that wounding factor that is very, very harmful. So people who are priests, people who are married, realize that uh, uh, they can do a lot of harm. <laughs> you know, husband and wife can do a lot of harm to each other. Of course, they can do a lot of good. So it's so important to understand the sacramental implications of marriage so that they continue to do good for each other. And it's so important for the priest to understand the sacramental implications of his own priesthood. So he doesn't because he becomes successful and trendy and you know, courageous to center and all those things. He can do a lot of harm. A more exalted position, the more potentiality of harm. So people must be kept humble. And I think Cardinal Ratzinger has an interesting response to this. This nothing which was the disciples share with Jesus expresses that one and the same time both power and infirmity. Both the power and the infirmity of the apostolic ministry. So Apostles of Christ, priests who follow Christ, must say to themselves, well, if it's true that without God we can do nothing, we are really uh, infirm. We are really suffering from an acute infirmity. <laughs> infirmity. We can't do anything without Him. So there's a recognition of one's own helplessness, one's own infirmity in the absence of God's grace. But at the same time, one understands the potentiality for power and effectiveness. If one is sacramentally united through Christ, and Christ is able to do it through, do it through the priest. So simultaneously, the Bible is saying, apostles should recognize both power and infirmity. That alone they can do nothing, so they're infirm. But with God, there's no limit to what they can do. It's good to, good to have that sense of infirmity because, um, as Pope John has advised of the priest, don't, don't turn your priesthood into a career. You know, where you make money and impress people and get your books published and get on you know, the Oprah Winfrey show and all of those things. Uh, because if it goes to your head and you start withdrawing from Christ, you can do a lot of harm. You can mislead people uh, terribly. So remember that uh, infirmity. But it's not an infirmity that's impotent, it's an infirmity that is a channel of great power. By themselves, with their own strength, they can do none of those things which apostles must do. How could they, of their own accord, say, I forgive you your sins? That's not the way the priesthood works. I mean, if it's a sacrament, and then one can say, I forgive you your sins, because the priest is representing Christ, and Christ can forgive sins. But apart from Christ, you can't go around forgiving people's sins. You can't go around saying masses and consecrating the Eucharist all by yourself on the basis of your individuality. How could they say on their own, I forgive you your sins? How could they say, this is my body? How could they perform the imposition on the hands and say, receive by the Holy Spirit? Uh, none of these things which constitute apostolic activity are done by one's own authority. So this is a kind of refutation of, of individualism. As individuals, really, we are infirm. But with Christ, uh, uh, there's no limit. Uh, St. Teresa of the Jew, who's a doctor in the church, once said in a cute little arithmetic uh, mood, uh, you have the number one, and if you put the zeros to the left of the number one, no matter how many zeros you put to the left, you don't increase the value of one. Right? That's not advanced math, is it? <laughs> <laughs> but if you put zeros to the right of one, you, you, you enlarge the number to the degree you add zeros, so 10, 100,000, 10,000. 
So you have to line, line yourself up because we're nothing, so to speak. We have this infirmity. We come out of nothingness. We're, you know, we come out of nothingness thanks to God's uh, creativity. All by ourselves, we can't do very much. We're like little zeros. But the zero can be very effective if it's put to the right of the one and not to the left. You know, you know piling up all those numbers to the left doesn't increase the value of one at all. So that is, I think it's probably a good reason why St. Therese is a, is a doctor of the church. Uh, this expropriation of their very powers constitutes a mode of feeling with Jesus, who is holy from the Father. If church usage calls ordination to the ministry of, of priesthood a sacrament, the following is meant. This is what it means when the church refers to ordination in ordination of the ministry of the priesthood of the sacrament. This means uh, that this man, is in no way performing functions for which he is highly qualified by his own natural ability. I mean, in baseball, like I guess if, if you look at the minor leagues, you're able for power, you're stealing bases, you have a good average, you're a good defensive player, people say, you know, uh, this is a good ball player, I think you should be promoted to the major leagues. But this isn't the way it works with the priest. You don't have a guy running around forgiving sins and saying mass and anointing people and, you know, making things. Turning into people to priests or whatever. You say he does that very well, we'll promote him to the you know, higher priesthood or whatever. It's not like that at all. It has nothing to do with one's individual accomplishments. What the sacrament means is that this man is in no way performing functions for which he is highly qualified by his own natural ability, nor is he doing the things that please him most and that are the most profitable. On the contrary, the one who receives the sacrament is sent to give what he cannot give of his own strength. He is sent to act in the person of another to be his living instrument. For this reason, no human being can declare himself a priest. For this reason, too, no community can promote a person to this ministry by its own decree. Only from the sacrament, which belongs to God, can priesthood be received. So in order to understand the priesthood, we have to take the notion of sacrament rather seriously. Mission can only be received from the one who sends from Christ in his sacrament, through which a person becomes the voice and the hands of Christ in the world. This gift of himself, this renunciation and forgetfulness of self, does not, however, destroy the man. Rather, it leads to true human maturity because it assimilates him to the Trinitarian mystery and brings to life the image according to which we were created. Of course, we're all supposed to die of ourselves, but in dying of ourselves, our lives become larger somehow. It's like mother's milk. The more the mother feeds her baby from her, her breast milk, the more of breast milk she has. It's, it's a case where you, you have more to the extent you give things away. It'd be nice to find an economic way of doing that and spend two hours and somehow you give three. Three, three, you have four. But the love is like that. I mean, love um, grows by giving it away. The more you, you try to just have a boomerang or something, you try to give it away, you, you can't get more. And uh, mother's milk is like that. So you feed the child and the body replenishes more and more than you need. And then if you stop feeding, the milk dries up. But uh, love is like that. Uh, the more you give, the more you, the more you get, <laughs> you get a hundredfold. Christianity is like that. You forget about your isolated, autonomous individuality and start living for other people, and you find that your life is enriched. This is the sacramental message applied to marriage and the sacramental significance of the priesthood because of the implication of the side, we are for others through love. And in community, we enrich our lives, we expand our lives. It's much, much more exciting. Uh, but we have to get back to that uh, notion of sacrament in order to uh, get this underway. The power to do what you cannot do alone is called a sacrament. People say, I want to do it by myself. I want to be independent. I want to do everything my way. <laughs> the Frank Sinatra's national anthem to autonomous individuality. I did things my way. Uh, There's a play by Edward Albee 
I have a sign for my father, and it's about a father who lived as a, an autonomous individual. He said, I lived in such a way that I could tell anybody else where to go. I don't need anybody, I don't need another person for anything I am. Self-sufficient all by myself. And he, refers, he uses this expression in the play several times. I am a self-made man. I'm a self-made man. <laughs> I made myself. I made myself. I'm a self-made man. He has a son who um, realizes this is nonsense. And he's trying to win his father's love. And he doesn't know how to do it. He doesn't know how to touch his father and find those, those springs of love. He wants to father has lost his wife and he's living it alone and is getting old and enfeebled. And the son wants this man to become a little bit more human than the way he's acting. Uh, but whatever the son does, goes to piano for him, tries to sing for him, it all fails. Finally the father dies, sitting all by himself in a chair, watching television that's no longer operating properly. The television is just going quacky. And as Playwright Rodalby says, without even an orange in his hand. Very tragic way to die. Without even an orange in his hand. There was no touch with anything. His mind had gone, television had gone, his friends had gone, didn't even have an orange in his hand. It's a horrible way to die. To die as an individual. And the mockery of his proclamation that he was a self made man. Well, if you're a self made man, this is not the way you exit. I suppose if you're a self made man, you just live forever. <laughs> really happy. Uh, just to continue a little bit more of what Ratzinger was saying about the priesthood and his sacramental character. We have seen that the priesthood of the New Testament, which appeared first in the Apostles, presupposes a true communion with the mission of Jesus Christ. The person who becomes a priest is grafted into his mission. For this reason, an intimate, he uses that word intimate, so we have intimacy within marriage, intimacy within the priesthood, intimacy between man and woman in God, in marriage, intimacy between the priest and Christ and his priesthood. For this reason, an intimate personal relationship with Christ is fundamental to priestly life and ministry. All priestly formation should lead to the fostering of this relationship. The priest should be a person who knows Jesus intimately. He's getting back to that notion of intimacy. Well, I mean, if priests don't want to be intimate with Christ, how can they expect to inspire husbands to be intimate with their, their wives? <laughs> we are reluctant to be intimate with another because we're born suspicious. But our destiny is to be for others. Right? We've got this immune system of hundreds of immunological receptors. But then, you know, there are these little breakthroughs that indicate that that's not the complete plan for the human being. Anthropologically, the human being should break out of that uh, prison house and uh, live for others through love in a married state or in a priestly state. For this reason, an intimate personal relationship with Christ is fundamental to a priestly life. All priestly formation should lead to the fostering of this relationship. A priest should be a person who knows Jesus intimately, has met him, has learned to love him. A priest should therefore be a man of prayer, a truly spiritual man. Without strong spiritual substance, he cannot last in his ministry. From the mystery of Christ, he should also learn in his life not to seek himself or his own promotion. He should learn to spend his life for Christ and for his flock. Keep returning to that simple preposition, for. <laughs> to be for rather than to be against. When we seek our own success, and of course we are really a success-driven society. When we seek our own success, the priesthood begins to appear as a burden, which surpasses our strength, and burdens too heavy for our shoulders to bear are the inevitable result. If you're trying to do something else by yourself, you're bound to frustrate yourself. <laughs> because how much can we do? And if we start doing harm, but Christ carries us in faith, and from our union with Christ, an invincible joy arises. There should be a joy to this kind of intimate relationship with Christ, which proceeds from the victory of Christ, who conquers the world and is with us to the very end of time. And then he says, and I will conclude with this, these couple sentences, from an intimate union with Christ, and once again, he referred to this intimacy. From an intimate
intimate union with Christ, there automatically arises also a participation in his love for human beings, in his will to save them and to bring them help. Now, the word participation is very, very important in John Paul's uh, personalism. The human beings are able to participate in the humanity of all human beings. We don't live outside of each other. We are able to participate. Uh, the Greeks have three words for life. Uh, one is bios, which means material life, the life that's in the plant. Uh, then there was suke, which is psychological life. And then the third was zoe, which is different than suke or bios. Suke, uh, 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 zoe, uh, was life that can be shared, life that transcended the individual thing that was living and can actually be shared. Then scholars of antiquity say that unless uh, there was this idea in culture that there is a third kind of life that people can share, shared life, then the Christian message wouldn't make any sense because Christ was talking about I am the life and uh, you should eat of me and you will have life. Christ was talking about Zoe life, life that can be shared. And so, you know, the Greeks really kind of provided a kind of philosophical prelude and basis for the understanding of uh, Christ's message. Uh, through Zoe life, we're able to participate in the divine life which enlarges and enriches our, our being. But the fact that we can participate in God's life uh, and, and, and free us from the solitude, the, the prison house of our own confirmed egoism is, uh, is, is, a, is a kind of a redemption. We want to be redeemed from isolated individuals so we can live more fully in, in participation with others and with, and with God. From an intimate union with Christ, there automatically arises also a participation in his love for human beings, in his will to save them and to bring them help. He who knows Christ from within wishes to communicate to others the joy of the redemption which has opened up for him in the Lord. Uh, one of the news journalists on television uh, after Bowman visited uh, in the States uh, was asked uh, uh, lonely on television, well, what do you think of Pope? <laughs> and as a secular journalist, he said, well, uh, the Pope seemed to give off an aura of a beatific sweetness. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, <laughs> well, what did you expect? Someone just like you? Or, I don't know. He would, and they had these, these funny, funny uh, attitudes toward the Pope. Uh, they, they weren't going to say, I suppose, well, I think I was in the presence of a man of God. A man of holiness, a man that uh, that was sharing in this divine life, and a man who was eager to have us share in that same divine life. But this uh, this smart aleck of little rejection, you know, giving off an aura of beatific sweetness, <laughs> it's like uh, uh, too much sugar, you know, you know you're on a diet. We can't. Think, I'm sorry, Pope uh, Benedict. Uh, you know, contrary to my doctor's advice, on um, a strict diet. Uh, like Bosco, he was diabetic, the doctor said, you, you're not allowed to listen to Dr. Shore or watch your show. She's <laughs> just too sweet, you know. <laughs> Pastoral labor flows from this communion of love. And even in difficult situations, it's always nourished by this motivation and becoming a life fulfillment. Tagore, who 
was a poet from India who wrote in the Bengali language, but that didn't prevent him from receiving the Nobel Prize for Literature. Uh, now, he says something here that I think is consistent with what uh, Cardinal Ratzinger is saying about uh, the sacraments, and that we, we should be a, a conduit so that uh, something better can speak through us. That if we become too involved in being fancy, and being successful, and adorning ourselves with jewelry and status and all kinds of things like that, then we won't allow the message to come through in its purity. It's like having a dirty window. You know, you want to clean the window so the window looks clean, so, so, so you can see outside, because the, the whole point of a window is to see through it, not to call attention to itself. Uh, so with that in mind, he, he's using the image of, of music as well as poetry. This is an English translation, so it's not that big. <laughs> it would be a sort of comical close if I read it in Bengali. <laughs> My song has put off her adornments. She has no pride of dress and decoration. Ornaments would mar our union. They would come between thee and me. Their jingling would drown thy whispers. My poet's vanity dies in shame before thy sight, O master poet. I have sat down at thy feet. Only let my life be simple and straight like a flute of reed for thee to fill with music. You know, in fact, it might be like a reed flute. It didn't have any obstructing ornamentations inside of it to prevent the music from going through. If I can only do one thing in my life, simple and correct, like being a, a reed flute, you can be filled with music. You know, the priest says, if there's only one thing I can do in my life, is to be united with God so I can be filled with His grace and His love and His life. And for two people who get married to say that to each other. Marriage is a sacrament, and we are supposed to be for each other. Wouldn't it be nice if we could do that? And there was beautiful music that comes out, you know, especially in the form of, of children, the, the creative um, uh, unification of, of, of husband and wife, the incarnation of their love. Okay, I don't know how long I've been speaking, but uh, goodness, tell us in fact, uh, should we uh, have a short break and then questions? Well, why don't we just, we'll take questions now. Okay, uh, yeah, uh, hi, how did you get that cover when, if they, if they ripped up the contract? <laughs> it, was a, it was a long and interesting story. Uh, he was ready to give up. So there was about 86,000 dollars worth of security, and there were, there were people on horseback, the police on horseback, there were police cars all over the place. There were, you know, there were special, you know, teams of like especially trained people for this kind of uh, thing. I had to give a talk uh, that day uh, in another part of Toronto. And I took my car there, and I had a hard time getting back to the hotel because there were police cars all over the place, and they were being great. Discourteous to me, I said, I, I registered at the hotel, heard my papers and everything else, and they didn't want me to go back. And they, the situation is so tense, it's like, you know, armed conflict or something. Um, finally, I met a, a reasonable policeman who allowed me to go back to the hotel. But there was a moment in which I said to myself, you know, I don't need this. I, <laughs> I can just drive home, and uh, why, why should I have to fight for the right to go back to the hotel? And, Maybe I should just go home. I said, no, that would be too cowardly. <laughs> I have a right to get back to the hotel, and even though it's a volatile situation, I should go back to the hotel. So I did. And, and it was then that I met the publisher, and I said, uh, well, there's one, one chance we have of getting the book, because uh, I think John Barker's daughter, Susan Barker, might be here. And uh, she does cover designs for Sophia Press in New Hampshire, and she might know where we can get it. And, and she did, and that's how, that's how we got it. But we probably wouldn't have got that had I just uh, <clears throat> gone home and avoided the, uh, the mayhem. So I think the story is kind of providential in a way. And he's a 
said, well, it's got it's cost me a bundle of those covers, so you'll have to surrender royalties on the first 500 copies sold. But I was happy to do that because I think the cover is very really important. Well, while well, I mean, talking about the covers, the um, these books are down there. They're, they're ten dollars each. I'm the dance man here for Dr. DeMarco. Uh, these are ten dollars a piece. If you buy them together, they're only fifteen. 